Our top story at 6.30, the CDC relaxing some of its COVID guidelines. The changes come more than two and a half years after the start of the pandemic. Here's what the changes look like. First, the CDC says Americans no longer need to quarantine themselves if they come into close contact with an infected person. Second, the agency says people no longer need to stay at least six feet away from others, so no more social distancing. The CDC also ended its recommendation that students exposed to COVID-19 should test regularly. The agency added all of that all of this can change if there's another surge in infections. And masks are still recommended in areas where community transmission is considered high. How will these new guidelines affect the Bay Area? Joining us tonight, Dr. Abar Karan with Stanford Medical School, specializing in infectious disease. Thank you for your time this evening. So some people say that this relaxation of the CDC guidelines is long overdue, that a lot of people are not even adhering to them anyway. Uh, others fear there's still a risk because COVID is still prevalent. What is your reaction? Hey, thanks so much for having me. So I think there's a few things going on. One is that, you know, pragmatically, a lot of people have not been following the recommendations such as quarantining. Quarantining is when you're exposed and not yet confirmed to be sick. Uh, and then isolating, we, even people that are sick um, may not be isolating for the entire time. Uh, you know, I've, I've personally heard of people who are traveling, were not able to change their plans, and so they just sort of, you know, did uh, wear a mask and, and continue onwards. So I think part of it was sort of the pragmatism that CDC said, well, you know, if the people aren't following the guidelines, let's try to ease them up a little bit. But the facts are the facts, and the transmission of the virus is the same. So if they said that you don't need to be six feet apart, the fact is the closer you are to somebody that's infectious, uh, the better chance that they transmit to you. So there's no change there. The science is the same. Quarantining, of course, is still important. Um, and, you know, quarantining is a, is a fundamental part of public health and epidemic response, which is that if you get exposed, you could be getting sick and transmitting to other people. So the fact that we're not going to have people doing this may not really have anything to do with what the CDC is saying. I think this hasn't been happening for a while anyways. Uh, and then re reducing testing is is not necessarily a good thing, right? Because when you don't test, then you don't know if people are sick or not. You don't know if you're sick or not. So the, the overall, I think what's happening is that we're moving or the CDC and the federal government are moving into a new phase. Uh, I've heard the term used living with COVID. Uh, at this time, we still have hundreds of deaths per day, thousands per week, thousands of infections around the country people out of work, uh, and then people in hospital beds and ICUs. The numbers are the numbers. You know, that is the situation. We're in a, in a very long surge. Um, but as they warn, you know, if things get even worse, everything's relative, then they may have to go back and reinstitute some of these public health measures. Um, but I think the science is the same. Transmission is the same. None of that has changed. It's sort of our reaction to it. So it's now kind of been put on us as individuals on our decisions on what we're going to do and how we're going to uh, follow this instead of uh, adhering to government guidelines. But what about uh, workplaces? Uh, is this going to give employers an opportunity to change their rules because there are some employers who still have pretty strict COVID regulations? Well, these are recommendations by the CDC and of course schools and employers and even state public health departments are all influenced by these, but these are not binding by any means. So workplaces can still in institute whatever they want. Uh, the legality of that obviously is going gonna, is gonna to change depending on on where you live and 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 what kind of place you're working at, um, but I think that you know you'll what I'll, what what I suspect is that people that have continued to mask um, and they may be doing that because they don't want to get sick, they may have vulnerable people at home, they'll probably continue to do it. People that haven't been masking for a while, anyways, they probably there will be no change to how they behave, um, and so I think that's kind of what will happen. People have been doing individual things for a while now because. We don't have a very coordinated response on this. It's very fragmented across states, even across counties. So, Doctor, I want to shift over to uh, another issue cropping up in your field, polio. Um, there's a cluster that showed up in one county in New York. Uh, London is now recommending that children under age nine get boosters for polio. Of course, this was something we all thought was gone. Um, what is your feeling about what's happening with polio right now? Well, we know that, you know, there has been polio in other countries. We still do see vaccine derived cases of polio. So people that get the oral polio vaccine uh, can still transmit polio after uh, through their through their feces. And so what we know about this case is that this is a traveler who went to a country where oral polio vaccine is used. They were not vaccinated. They are from a community that I think has low vaccination rates. They came back here, were diagnosed with polio. 
And then there is polio now found in the water. And, you know, this is going to primarily affect kids that are not vaccinated. And as we know now for a while, there have been pockets within this country uh, where there has been a lot of vaccine hesitancy for va childhood vaccinations among certain groups. Uh, and so people that are not kids that are not vaccinated are of course going to be at risk here uh which is why the the county and uh the state of new york are really focusing in here uh on this problem and why the uk is trying to get ahead of it as well but i think broadly you know this really connects to a lot of other things so with covid for instance there's been a lot of shift around how people view vaccines even related to covid uh with monkeypox there's a vaccine shortage where we need more vaccine here many countries have no vaccines so this is a broader problem in epidemics uh where you know you need to have a lot of public buying in and you need to work within communities to understand why people are not getting vaccinated. And you set up my next question perfectly because that's exactly what I was going to ask you regarding monkeypox and everything else that's going on out there. You have two camps. You have people who say, I'll get a vaccination if it's going to help me live a safer life and others who just don't trust the government, don't trust vaccines, you know, the anti-vaxxers. Um, so I, I guess I'm asking you is the people who are getting vaccinated have a better chance of carrying on and, and moving forward and those who don't get vaccinated run a, a higher risk of getting sick or even dying. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, vaccines are, are the number one public health tool that we have, uh, you know, broadly speaking across all categories of diseases. So uh, getting people vaccinated, it used to be something that people were happy to do, wanted to do. We, you know, we're celebrating the advent of vaccines and availability of vaccines. Um, and now that has really changed. And I think a lot of that is uh, the sort of social response to public health, um, how people view the government, whether or not they trust public health institutions and governmental leaders. There's a lot of work to be done here, and I think COVID has made it a lot more challenging. There was a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of two sides of, of how people were viewing COVID, and it really polarized uh, the view on, on public health more broadly. So I think we're seeing that now with um, what's going on with polio uh, and also what uh, may happen with monkeypox. Doctor, real quick, uh, we're out of time. Why are we seeing so many viruses crop up, All it seems, all of a sudden? Uh, you know, I think one part of it is certainly uh, globalization, where we have a lot more interconnectedness between countries. But, you know, specifically talking about monkeypox, once we stop vaccinating for smallpox, many people have been warning for a long time that, you know, there's a large susceptible population of people that are, are you know, growing up and don't have immunity. And we knew there was outbreaks of monkeypox happening in, in sub-Saharan Africa. If we had put more attention and time into controlling those and helping those countries and health systems, we may not be dealing with this today. So. I think this is a big problem uh, in terms of the global global health equity is what, what we call it. Yeah, hopefully uh, that will be addressed. It's clear that that does need to be addressed and hopefully moving forward, more governments will be aware of that and take the necessary action. Thank you so much, Dr. Abrar Karan. We appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate your expertise. Thanks Thank again. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Coming up is